Let me first introduce myself. I'm Brian Armstrong. I am the director of the chair of digital business at the Bits Business School. And in that capacity, I do a lot of work thinking about and researching and lecturing and consulting in this whole area of digitalization, digital transformation, digital maturity, and how it's changing business. And one thing that I think we've all noticed is how we always used to talk about disruption and digital disruption was the biggest source of disruption. And then along came COVID, which has been an absolutely major source of disruption to most people. And with regard to digital, what we saw COVID has done is a lot of people argue, and I think correctly, that essentially COVID has fast forwarded digitalization more aggressively in the space of four or five months than was achieved in the previous four or five years. And things like e-commerce and distribution and digital channels have really taken off. I think what we need to recognize is that there's two, two things at play here. The first is that what COVID has done is, how should we say, broken a log jam of resistance to digital channels and digital behaviors and has demonstrated the true market potential of some things in many cases. And to that extent, when COVID is finally beaten, that level of digitalization will persist. There are other areas though that Frankly, people have just have to adopt digitalization because it's the only way of doing business. So virtual meetings and so on. I'm sure much of that will persist, but there will also be a return to a degree of face-to-face -face business because business is a social activity in a way. So we'll see a lot of change going forward. But the other thing, and this leads me to today's discussion, that, that we've seen COVID do is that it has highlighted that even in the midst of a major crisis, one can find opportunity. And today we'll be speaking to four entrepreneurs who will be showing you how, if you had a, a, a venture that had a sustainable business model, um, that the crisis hasn't necessarily uh, been the end of the game. This clearly is, is different for different sectors. It's not true for everybody but that if you came in with a sustainable business and were running a good business, that you were in a good position to survive the storm, so to speak. The second is that digital platforms are an effective and practical way to reach and engage people and platform for growth for your business. And that indeed people are more connected now than they were pre-COVID. And that those with digital engagement strategies and digital engagement mechanisms are well positioned um, to actually go forward and that this crisis can actually be seen as an opportunity for them. We'll also see that COVID, um, whilst disrupted for agile entrepreneurs can be turned into an opportunity, particularly by harnessing digital platforms. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. To lead us into that, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's discussion. Uh, who is some kid like Lisa, and she's an entrepreneur with a very keen interest in using technology for social impact as well as to solve business problems. She's created award-winning marketing and digital campaigns with a focus on millennials and so-called Gen Zs. And she's the co-founder of Seek Insight, which is a learning platform which gives entrepreneurs and professionals access to the top 3% in business marketing and tech talent around the world. So enough from me. Thanks, Samke. I'm going to hand over to you and you will then um, lead us through the discussion. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, my name is Samke, as Brian has introduced. I am one of the founders of Seek Insight. We've collaborated with the Bits Business School to bring you today's discussion. Um, I'm particularly passionate about where the world is going and how technology has evolved the way in which we do everyday things in our lives. Um, today in our panel discussion, um, Brian has done a lot of the work of just unpacking what it is that we will be talking about, but I'd like to contextualize this afternoon's conversation with some background and research that has been conducted on e-commerce in Africa and more specifically in South Africa. 
Africa has been identified as one of the fastest growing digital markets in the world. And understanding how people connect to their world helps business leaders and policymakers allocate resources and decide on strategy. But the world more so online does not have one homogenous identity. Uh, a study was done with MasterCard along the Fletcher School at Tufts that has been researching the growth of digital economy in 2008. They found in the Digital Ev Evolution Index, where they tracked the footprint of 50 countries and analyzed the key drivers of barriers to the, to the country's evolution to the digital economy, that demand, um, which is consumer demographics, income and internet access, supply, technology and infrastructure, institutional environment, which are, would be government policy, and innovation, which is the environment for creating startups and the overall competitive landscape, were some of the, the very, very meaningful um, attributes to what would make an environment that would work for digital or not. South Africa, out of these 50, country, 50, 50 countries, ranked 33rd, the highest African country, and second only to China in the BRICS group of trade partners. Factors in South Africa's favor, as identified in the index, included an 86% cell phone market saturation and the most developed telecommunications network in Africa, which is almost 100% digital. In terms of government regulations, plans to give broadband access to all citizens within the next five years help to push the country's score in the breakout category higher. South Africa was also the fourth, fourth fastest growing digital economy behind China, Malaysia, and Thailand. Um, and this is research that has been conducted prior to the coronavirus uh, pandemic that hit South Africa and we had our lockdown towards the end of March. And recently we've obviously seen really interesting developments in the e-commerce and digital economy sector as people around the world found themselves adjusting to a new normal due to the coronavirus outbreak. The pandemic has been a catalyst, as mentioned earlier by Brian, in the advancement of the use of online shopping and general digital mediums as a way to prevent human contact. Since the beginning of the outbreak, we've seen an increase of over 300% in online purchases, with grocery shopping, pharmaceutical products, and personal care topping the list of items purchased. However, whilst those who were privileged enough to be afforded the opportunity took advantage of e-commerce, and the digital economy, it's also important to acknowledge that our country has the highest um, and the greatest income inequality amongst its people in the world, with the top 1% of South African earners taking home almost 20% of all income in the country, while the top 10% take home 65%, leaving the remaining 90% of South African earners getting only 35% of total income. The inequalities also present themselves in our geographical landscape with many online stores not offering options for delivery in remote areas and areas considered to be high risk as well as rural areas. In this afternoon's discussion, we'll analyze the current and past trends related to digital and the e-commerce economy, as well as understanding the role the sector will play in improving the socioeconomic landscape in South Africa going forward. The discussion will also take a look at some of the challenges and opportunities that exist, particularly within the rural and township economies, and the role that infrastructure in these communities will play in the advancement of the digital economy. We're joined uh, this afternoon by Notando Tembe, and thank you so much to the speakers who have joined us today. Notando is the founder of a digital and design agency called NT Communications that focuses on strategy, brand building, and digital marketing. NT Communications exists to help transform small to medium-sized businesses reach their full potential. And through her personal brand, um, as Notando is also quite an avid social media use user, Notando continues to educate and empower small business owners about the digital, digital space, but is also into entrepreneurial prin principles that will drive commitment and growth for their brands. We also uh, welcome the co-founders of Bottles, the app that we have seen um, quite a lot of coverage from in terms of how they have pivoted uh, from just offering alcohol service on on-demand delivery to now evolving into alcohol as well as uh, grocery delivery. Vince Viviers and Enrico Ferrigoli, both who are co-founders of the Bottles app, which has seen phenomenal growth. Um, obviously, once they made a decision to pivot during the national lockdown, they will be speaking um, around what types of decisions led them to where they are today and what type of actions one will need to take 
in the business environment if they want to keep up with certain types of developments, particularly in tech. Also joined by C.I. Dacteta, who is an impact entrepreneur. He developed solutions that solve some of the most intricate challenges facing rural areas, particularly youth unemployment. He grew up in KZN and has previously founded tech companies in Kenya and Norway. Sianda grew up in a rural um, environment. However, he was exposed to international technologies that have helped him adopt and develop a global innovations and technologies and localize them to solve problems facing rural South Africa. In 2019, Sianda founded Kulula, Kulula South Africa's first rural online grocery delivery and store and service. Kulula enables rural households and spaza shops to purchase groceries and stock online or by phone and have the order delivered to their home or business within 24 hours. And at the same time, Kulula is digitizing the rural, the rural grocery supply chain. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, if you would like to maybe just say hello and maybe give yourselves a, a quick introduction on who you are and, and what you're all about. I think I've pretty, pretty much covered that. Um, I don't know if you'd agree. Yeah, sure, no, that was great. Sure. So, I mean, as Brian had said, and I think as I'd gotten into more depth as well, we've all seen some really interesting developments that have been catalyzed by the coronavirus outbreak that have shifted consumer behavior over the last couple of months uh, during the national lockdown. And it goes without saying that many businesses have had to either find new ways to continue operating or completely shut down their businesses during this unfortunate time. However, that hasn't necessarily been the reality for a lot of online businesses as people have now spent more time indoors consuming online entertainment or obviously uh, making purchases online. What have been the changes you have seen in your businesses? This is a question to all. And how have these changes affected the nature of your business? Um, Sianda, we can start with you. Well, um, I've used this opportunity and I've said that as much as COVID-19 has been unfortunate, but I've used this opportunity to see uh, if I could launch additional products, not in a pivot uh, manner, but in a manner of expanding my current offering. For example, um, the highest risk group under COVID-19 that was my customer base uh, was those who are diabetic or are under chronic medication for various uh, illnesses. And uh, because I have access to them and already delivering food, I actually offered delivering uh, medicines, current medicines. Uh, so those who are under the CCMDD national project who receive ARVs or hypertension tablets or chronic medicines, I have used the opportunity to create an additional uh, service, which is to deliver to my customers for free. So what I've seen is that I've seen additional customers coming to buy my main product, my uh, so anchor product, which is the groceries, in order to also access um, their medical uh, services. So I am an uh, impact entrepreneur. So as much as I think, how do I make money? At the same time, how do I benefit society? So I have to always sort of juggle with uh, those sides of my business. With yourselves at Bottles, Vince and Enrico, how have you guys seen um, any changes now that obviously we're far into the, the, the lockdown in South Africa and now we're at level three, but what have been some of the changes that you have seen? Look, I think from our side, um, we've been in the e-commerce game for more than four years now. So we, we believed in e-commerce before a lot of people did. In fact, we didn't realize this, but um, at the time, we launched the first on-demand shopping app in the country. Um, if, if I take you back to early 2016, Mr. Delivery was still a menu that would live on your fridge that you'd page through and then you'd call Steers and ask them to bring you a burger. Um, and Uber Eats didn't even exist yet. Um, so we originally launched as an alcohol delivery app and actually the first shopping app, in the um, on-demand shopping app in the country at that time. Um, I think that we've obviously seen in a time of a lot of uncertainty and a, a, lot, of, a, lot, of, a lot of pressure, we were nearly seriously affected ourselves. Um, alcohol was banned and our business was facing an existential crisis. Um, and I think our, uh, we had a massive fear of what are we going to do? What about the staff that, um, that, what about the team that we've built? What about everything we've done for these four years? I think we were fortunate to, to be in a sector that has experienced massive growth, right? We are in e-commerce, we're in last mile fulfillment, we're in on-demand deliveries. And that was a sector that was really needed now. There's a need to keep people safe in their homes and, and people really want to be able to shop 
in a simple way on their phone and get things delivered to their door quickly. Um, and we've seen massive growth as a result. I think just between March and April, when lockdown originally started, we had doubled our user base, we quadrupled our orders, we're growing around 600% year on year. And I think that while this, obviously there's a lot of negatives to this virus, one positive we can take out is it's really transformed e-commerce probably by four or five years ahead of where it was before. And yourself, Natando? Um, so for us, being a digital agency, we don't obviously deal with a lot of issues that we might have faced personally, but uh, we were forced to now change our marketing um, in terms of aligning to be appealing to brands, product-based brands more especially, uh, in order for them to get more uh, digital skills that they might want, people who wanted to be uh, online, their websites, e-commerce websites and all of that. And then with some of our or like clients that we already had, we either had to work on new strategies in order for them to continue operating. So an example of one of our clients that we do work with is Johnson & Johnson Global Health, and they run a youth program uh, here in KZN and in Joburg. The youth program is basically based in schools. So when COVID happened, schools shut down, obviously, and they can't now also be in the communities. And for safety reasons, they couldn't do their face-to-face -face, uh, education program. So we had to find a way to continue with the program online. So when, as soon as that happened, we had to work on a new strategy, find a good system that will work um, online and on WhatsApp, which we ended up doing instead of having to lose the clients and for them to shut the whole program out. Um, and some of our events clients as well, they had to find a way to now still continue operating. So I think that is the biggest lesson that we had to face um, and the biggest challenge is that instead of saying, yes, shut down, what can we offer the clients uh, in order for them to change their strategy and offering new skills. So we were also forced to also just be educated a bit more, add um, new people on the team that will be able to do your advanced e-commerce websites and all the stuff that people need. So it's been um, a quite a few great months in adjusting and learning and obviously being able to assist the current clients and gaining more clients during this time. And I do see um, a bit more coming in as well over the next few few months. I think closer to the end of the year, there's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going to deal with. Okay, so what I'm gauging is that collectively, um, there's been a, a huge shift in the way people perceive the, the, the online world, for, for lack of a better word, um, because they've been forced to be indoors and obviously either make purchases online uh, or, you know, find ways of, of communicating without necessarily getting to a newspaper, in your case, Notando, where you are in the digital marketing space. Um, and I, I believe, obviously, it wasn't easy to get to the point where you are at the moment. For, for most of you, I, I wouldn't necessarily say maybe for, for some of the businesses, it wasn't the pipelines. What kind of pivot strategy did you implement in order to ensure that your business continues to operate. I'll start with, with, with either Vince or Enrico, just because I think there has been obviously quite a lot of developments. You guys had alcohol completely black, banned, so there was no opportunity for you to sell to, to anyone, which was your core, your core product. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, quite, a, quite a crazy time when, uh, um, when we first heard that alcohol may be banned uh, um, we were quite scared to be honest and uh, i think that we were uh, fortunate that we already had a working relationship at the time with pick and pay and it was just literally in, in three days uh, with the two teams came together and said we need to start you know we need to do something about it where we we gonna have a hard lockdown where a lot of people are at risk and we need to you know keep them in the safety of the house and we also had it at the team of like 20 people that you know were, were at serious risk so um in the in the span of three days we literally took down all the liquor and we listed a whole lot of grocery we started with about 500 items at two of our key stores and uh, the response was incredible and uh, and literally in the next uh, in the next uh, two weeks uh, we rolled out to about 65 stores 
and uh, we started delivering groceries. So, so I guess that, you know, look at looking back at, at what, what we built for three years um, and, and what we have now, it actually still feels at, at times quite weird that we now a grocery app, right? And of course, when, when Lika first came back, we added Lika, but we didn't necessarily, you know, you know remove grocery. It's, it's a big opportunity for us, uh, 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 for us now. And, uh, and I think that, I, I guess that the story is that we have pivoted in three days. The reality is that we have been pivoting for four months. Um, we have been, we, 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 we have had a lot of catch up to do in terms of how is the grocery experience, uh, the, the grocery shopping experience different from a liquor shopping experience. You're going from three items in your basket to 20 items in your basket. Um, you're going from shopping by aisle, you shop by, you want vodka and you want tonic, to shopping mainly with search. Um, you go from picking in a very small store to picking in a gigantic store. So we've, we're still pivoting. And I think uh, that, that's why for me, the, 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 the biggest learning, I think, at this time of, of uh, of, of pivoting is really that as an entrepreneur, you, you got to see this as an opportunity and, uh, and you're going to keep going uh, uh, at it. All right. Thanks, Enrico. Um, it's interesting that you speak around the, the timelines, you know. Um, one of the, the, the observations that I've made about digital business is that it is quite dynamic and it is one that is ever evolving. What do you feel are some of the opportunities um, that are unique to a digital business given the fast growth and adoption that has happened over the last couple of months? Look, I think, I think if, you, if you look at the, the, the kind of, uh, the, I, think, I think that the, 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 an important element in how we have managed uh, to pivot um, is that we have always tried to be a lean startup and we always try to have structures and systems in places uh, to, you know, to be able to act fast and have a very, you know, not have a lot of hierarchy, have a very lean uh, structure. And that really helped us, I think, to pivot as well as having strong partnerships with people and and businesses that we felt were on the same trajectory, right? You look at you look at Pick and Pay, and you you see the 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 first online grocery retailer, really. And, and I think that really helped us because uh, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a, a connection or or an, or an alignment of ideas on on what we had to do um, in that specific point in time. So so I think that that was really important. Uh, um, uh, to us and, 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 and I think that the other element was the people that were, uh, um, that, that, that we hired, the people that work uh, with us. I think that was the other big thing for me. Uh, we, the, the first month, I think that no one in my team worked, uh, uh, had, had one day off and no one, that, and everybody kind of rallied around it because they all understood the opportunity and they all understood the crisis and the importance of what we were doing. So, so I think those were, I think, the most, two most important elements. All right. And to Notando, yours is a little bit different to the other gentlemen on, that are speakers on the panel. Yours is a service business and not necessarily an e-commerce business. It's a service business that is driven um, using technology. What would you say um, have been, you know, the, the, the opportunities or what would you say is unique about your digital business that has helped you during this time? Um, I'd say for us, it's communication um, and obviously being able to sell yourself for small businesses, especially to trust uh, what you might be giving them. Uh, we have positioned ourselves in such a great way when it comes to uh, marketing ourselves online. Uh, like, we say, like I said, majority of the things that we do is educating small businesses about what is available for them online. Uh, in order for their businesses to um, either be positioned, either to reach their clients. But I think more than anything is to sell. Um, that should be what they should be focusing on. So uh, with everything that has been happening, we have uh, readjusted our strategy around e-commerce more than anything and working with product-based businesses. Uh, we hardly ever did um, 
like photo shoots and all of that. So we've done a lot of uh, shooting products over the past few months. Uh, so clients, so because we've gotten a lot of client uh, product based clients. So we've now added more uh, onto our services. We now are also just uplifting our skills with the team where they are now doing more SEO, learning more uh, e-commerce items uh, that they need to know in, in terms of putting together a, a proper strategy and all of those things. So I think for us, uh, that's how we stand out in order to, for the clients to att be attracted to what we do and to understand the importance of, of the things that we offer to small businesses. Because I think that's where we get a lot of misunderstanding as to, okay, why am I paying for A, B, and C? Maybe I can do it myself because obviously it's like social media and I, I can do it. Um, I'm already on Facebook, I'm already on Instagram. So it's just educating a bit more, sharing a bit more uh, into detail, some of the things that are available. Um, if you are an e-commerce website, Facebook has a shop, Instagram has a shop that you can also use uh, on your business. A lot of people are just not as educated about the tools that are available online for free. So that's what we do. Um, that's the process that we try and go into so clients can then trust in, in the work that we do and see the importance of paying for it. All right, thanks for that, Notando. Um, Sianda, your business is a little bit interesting in the sense that you focus uh, specifically on the rural economy. Um, in South Africa, we know that we live in a country where there are quite a lot of inequalities. You know, we, we have the highest Gini coefficient in the world, and we have a large majority of our country of Black South Africans living in either township or rural economies, with about 33% of our population in rural areas. You know, um, South African government has committed themselves to growing infrastructure in order to enable the advancement of our but however, do you feel given our current inequality rate, this type of development will assist in bridging inequality or not, uh, considering that only service and delivery businesses will be impacted positively with these changes, one. And then the other question was, how are you navigating an environment where, for instance, a lot of um, service providers don't necessarily go to quite remote parts of the country? So I'll start by answering the second question, and it goes back to actually the fundamental infrastructure, which is roads, right? So already you might have an e-commerce platform, but the people need to get their product. But getting their product is a hell of a difficulty because the roads are really bad in rural areas. So that is a huge disadvantage for us as entrepreneurs, and perhaps one of the hindrances as to why people might not start these type of businesses. Um, and uh, going back to the first point, you know, the cost of data. It's extremely, extremely, extremely difficult uh, for us to navigate around. More importantly, because we see, at least in our online shop, that only 5% of our sales go through our app, right? The majority of our sales go through WhatsApp and uh, through a channel of, please call me, and we call back those customers, and then it becomes verbal, which means that it takes a lot of time to actually process an order and get it made. So in as much as we might build sort of like uh, e-commerce infrastructure or build the fourth industrial revolution infrastructure, a lot of people do not understand the functionalities or to operate the functionalities of the infrastructure, at least in a rural area. So what we've needed to do was to create channels that can actually assist those people who are less, uh, I'll say, technologically inclined than we are. But what we're really, really being interested in now is that we see a lot of youth kids that are in high school staying at home with their grandmothers and parents, actually beginning to make purchases uh, on behalf of those parents. And then we're able to quickly channel those uh, to WhatsApp and so on. So it's very important to at least keep that ethos of being a, an inclusive society where you create channels with different people, at least the majority uh, of our people are able to access us. Because once we get these kids on board at the age of 17, 18, at the age of 25, they'll be breadwinners and they'll be shopping online. So in the next five to seven years, we'll see a lot of rural people beginning to make purchases online. They've got smartphones, yeah, sure. The smartphone penetration is high, but if you are unable to use that smartphone, it becomes a challenge. All right, um, thanks for that, Sia. So I think for the most part, you are finding that the, the patterns of behavior are a little bit different with younger people um, making purchases on behalf of their families and as well as them hopefully in the future being the rural economy. 
what do you feel? What are some of the other lessons that you've learned in, in, in the, the rural economy, particularly for e-commerce? Um, good question. So what e-commerce has brought, at least on my behalf, is an opportunity to really uh, tap an untapped or underserved market. So when I talk about it, do it in a unique manner. For example, when we deliver food to the household, it's very awkward for them that someone delivers the food to their doorstep. But the company representatives or the agents who deliver are so well presented, they pack the food and in a very seamless effort, even go if the mama would allow into a house. We didn't do it now with reason of COVID. But what we discovered is that these things that our um, uh, rural customers have not been getting through service, like impeccable service, they really, really appreciate it. And we discovered that when we first started, when the service wasn't so great, uh, the customer return rate wasn't so great in those communities. But the more we got better, at least with those really personified uh, services, um, the return rate got better. So uh, popular opinion would say that, you know, rural communities don't really care about these things. They just want uh, product delivered and they go, no. They tend to want the same level of care, the same level of attention, as you would give to a city-based customer. And we've done this by really creating a real smart onboarding uh, process uh, with our uh, teams, where there is a video, they go through the video, they run the test, and um, they're now able to provide an impeccable service uh, to our customers. All right, um, thanks for that, Sianda. I'd like to encourage the participants in today's session, and thank you so much for joining us, to please ask your questions in the comment box. We've had a couple come through um, from Nita Suka, who said, good afternoon. My question is posed to Enrico and Vincent. Firstly, thank you for a great app, which has become an essential service in my world. I'd like to understand the level of complexity of the platform's technology. Was this an enabler or a hindrance to pivoting the business model? It was, it was definitely an advantage that we had. We, uh, one of the things that we did uh, um, well before COVID, so uh, back when we started partnering with Pick and Pay, was to integrate our, our two systems, right? So we have built a pretty robust uh, uh, system that would exchange uh, information such as stock levels and prices, uh, buy store on a daily basis. So, so one of the things that would have been really complicated and probably almost impossible to do would would have been to um, pivot the the product menu. Right? If we have had to ask ninety stores, do you uh, list this variant of broccoli? <laughs> um, it would have been a really difficult uh, process, right? Um, but the fact that we could literally um, start listing uh, uh, a thousand products, right? And then the next day we would know exactly how many, uh, how many of each uh, uh, barcode. So we would use barcodes to connect the two systems. How many, how many of these barcodes are available at each store, and what is the price? Um, was uh, was really an enabler for us to pivot. Probably, I think the single most important, uh, single most important point. All right. And then another question from Nita is, from a consumer behavior purchase perspective, how, would, how well have consumers adopted non-alcoholic and de-alcoholized products? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I think, look, we've seen massive growth. And clearly, even before COVID, we knew there was a massive need for grocery delivery, pet food, baby food. Um, there are many different verticals outside of alcohol only that there is a much needed demand for having them right now or having them delivered to your home. And I think we, we've always believed in that. And we've been in partnership with Pick and Bay for two years and we've been trying to drive them to believe this goal with us. It took a global pandemic for it to really fast track some decision-making in a big corporate. And, um, and I think that uh, we've seen massive uptake. So as I said, from just from March to April, we um, have, uh, so firstly, we've quadrupled uh, our volume and doubled the basket size. So on average, people were spending about 300 Rand with us. Now they're spending about 600 Rand with us on grocery items. And since liquor has been banned, we've seen um, all of the non-alcoholic brands that we've listed are absolutely flying. And, and, and uh, we, all of the, the, the brands that are running these, Hunter, Savannah, Jason, Louis, et cetera, are all coming to us to push them more because we're seeing a really big uptake in this. 
Um, so yeah, I think overall, but, but across all the different verticals that we're playing in now, in addition to alcohol, they've done really, really well, as well as the alcoholized products too. Right. All right. Thanks for that, Vincent. I think it's been quite interesting, solely having been in the alcohol sales space, moving into groceries. Um, you know, not everybody in South Africa drinks. So I think it's interesting to see that it's actually been such huge growth for you guys. Um, and, and I think this has obviously been such, an, such a great learning um, for, for everybody. Um, and this is another question from Stride IT. Hey everyone, thank you for the great chat. I'm keen to learn more about the business model regarding drivers and deliveries. How has that been developed? And are drivers given some type of percentage of a fee or are they paid in terms of just a, a sort of a once-off monthly cost? And is this an ecosystem that's beneficial to drivers? Mm. So, so the, I think that the model uh, uh, developed over a few years. I think that when we started, we literally had to get our first drivers, uh, you know, that almost employed, right? And then I think in the in the next four or five years, you've seen that now at, in, on every road, there's thousands of drivers uh, 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 doing deliveries. And the usually uh, the the fee that we give to drivers is higher than what we charge our customers. Uh, by 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 a large mile, right? So so no delivery app would make money off the delivery. Um, we would always have to 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 pay them more than than what we charge customers. Um, is it beneficial to them? It, it definitely gives them a, a you know a job opportunity. Um, it is it is hard work. Uh, I won't lie. I think it is hard work for, for them. I think, it is, I think they are very often the breadwinners of the family. And I think it does give them uh, a very good, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good um, income. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to share that necessarily, but I, can, I, I think that um, for the type of job, uh, looking at comparison without a similar job where you would get that same salary is, is, is a good, it, it's a good income. All right, and yourself, Sianda? Um, okay, well, firstly, uh, the delivery vehicles are owned by Kulula, so we own them. And the reason for that has been one of the challenges we face is that having a third party agent doing the deliveries uh, wasn't maybe tentative to providing an excellent service to our customers who really care about a good service. Uh, but secondly, also, it's just an internal rule. Uh, my border and I um, concluded that 70% of our staff are going to be female. So all our drivers are female. Uh, and one thing that you've learned about that is the reliability. They're looking after, after the vehicle and uh, the service to the customers has been great. Um, and thirdly is that we did try to attempt to have a third party delivery and in those areas that we did, the return rates of the customers and the complaints were really, really high. So um, we also work with bigger cars. So a vehicle, a delivery vehicle can go with maybe 15 orders at one time. So we can take the hit of actually maybe owning our own delivery vehicles. And also, um, it's a largely informal sort of areas that we work in. So a lot of the delivery vehicles are owned by very old uh, guys who might traditionally not want to change the way in which they work. So now we get an opportunity to bring young females to actually do the delivering, and it's been working really, really well. Uh, and again, this goes to the sort of social uh, challenges that we face of rural, rural youth unemployment. So we get an opportunity to bring them on board. Um, so yeah, females are then definitely involved in the ecosystem because of that, youth are brought into the ecosystem because of that. However, we really do want to share, uh, find a solution as to how we, or a model, and how we bring the existing uh, rural delivery agents onto our system, because that will obviously um, cut a lot of capital invested. Uh, however, you know, our customer comes first. Um, and then secondly, uh, our, we've got two set, sets of value proposition. One is to the rural customer, and then one is to our commercial partners which is sort of digitizing the, the, um, the rural FC, FMCG supply chain. So we're able to then find out exactly what type of products, where they're going, who's buying them at what time. And we, sell, and we share the data uh, with, or we'll share the data with uh, suppliers. We have no idea of what's going on within the rural market. Uh, right. So yeah, I think it answered the question. Sure, no, that, that was a great answer, Sia. And another question is, which retail stores have you partnered with? I don't know if you can disclose this. And uh, which areas are you servicing 
I think you, yeah. you've, you've spoken to the, the cars because the, the other question was, what fleet of cars are you owning or are they uh, contracted? And I think you've spoken mm -hmm. to that in terms of answering that question. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think the question was which big retail, uh, we're not partnering with any big retail shops. In fact, uh, we are procuring our own stock at Bulk. Uh, when I say at Bulk, we still have adopted really smart systems that actually have given us trends uh, of how our consumers consume. So we actually don't keep our stock for more than three weeks or two weeks uh, at least. So we are able to buy as much as we don't get much margin, but we are trying to sort of create a real independent standalone retail art, uh, shop or business. Uh, and secondly to that, we are going to develop a new business model where we bring in big suppliers, which hopefully it will work. And we are in the process of negotiating some suppliers where we actually keep product for them and uh, we distribute it because we are now we are sort of accumulating huge market bases, eating up a lot of market share from the existing um, traditional retailers and rural outlets. So what you want to do is leverage that uh, market share that you are possessing bring in suppliers to directly uh, bring their stuff to us and we can distribute it on commission, perhaps. Although that might be a totally different business model, but again, we are innovating, so we are trying to new ways. But no, we are not partnering with any retail outlets, and I think I've answered them on the call. All right. Um, another question, Sia, which is, is quite interesting, and I'll put it, it's, it's a couple of questions, but I'll put it into one. Um, when it comes to the, the, the rural, to rural areas, there's obviously not an issue of payment, but a lot of people have different ideas around, you know, banking. So there is quite a majority of people that are either unbanked or have accounts that don't necessarily um, have a capability to make online purchases. What payments methods are you using and what type of challenges have you found in driving digital, digitalization of payments? And yeah. um, another question is, are you building some level of confidence? So in terms of rural people, their confidence in the shift from physical purchases to e-commerce or WhatsApp. Mm. And, and with that being said, are you working with people in their communities and advertising their services in this way? Yeah. Uh, the rural sort of LSM uh, market is extremely uh, cash intensive, right? So you'd find that at least 60% now of our sales are done through cash. So our vehicles have got drop stakes. However, the money is uh, not to an extent that it will uh, offset a bombing of our vehicles or a robbery. You have to take the whole car due to having a drop safe. But now we do uh, have Yoko card machines in the vehicle. So there is a cash on delivery on that. And uh, a lot of the FASTA cards, uh, social development uh, department cards, uh, are enabled to swipe with the Yoko card machine. Uh, whereas some uh, rural customers do actually pay online, uh, the percentage which I mentioned earlier. So that really assists, but we do hope, uh, if not, we'll just create our own fintech entity that allows a very efficient uh, exchange of money, which is really, really important, uh, at least for the security of our drivers. And then uh, building the confidence. Again, I think with regard to having more rural people uh, being young, making orders through us, and we really present ourselves as hip and savvy. Now, we've seen a lot of confidence in people just like sort of SMSing on WhatsApp, communicating and having a tele telesales uh, team that is able to respond and communicate. And our people are actually, or the rural customers are really, really responding really well to that. And we obviously contain or, or maintain a lot of data, which we collect from which is their phone numbers. So in terms of accessing them, number one, because data is so expensive, we can't publish photos on Facebook because they are on the Facebook free, which they don't get photos. And if you have just a message, then it's not attractive enough and it doesn't trend and they don't get to see it. So that's tough. That's not an option. So our communication channel is directly through SMS advertising, but then we're able to channel all our advertising through SMS and communication to each specific village. And we've mapped out our villages. So we know exactly which village, for example, is not buying or has a lower percentage of returning. Uh, and we try to discover why, but also uh, we've developed a pretty innovative uh, customer location system. So we are able at certain times, the good thing is that our African communities are very contact-based, so we can visit them. Our ambassadors actually, you've got a fleet, uh, a group of 30 ambassadors that can go door to door to our customers to figure out what are their challenges and how can we solve them. Of course, the contact has been less due to COVID. But again, this seems labor intensive and heavy, but that is how rural communities focus. So it's one thing to come with these technologies and enablers, However, the uh, sort of traditional way of doing business still works in rural areas. So why don't we blend both sets? And it's been working really, really well. 
So that's how we advertise and uh, our people are really, really confident in using e-commerce now to make purchases, purely because they can pay once the food gets to their doorstep. All right. Um, thanks, Sia. Yeah. That was quite interesting. I think it's, it's very interesting to find um, opportunities where a lot of people might not see them. Um, and obviously with working, this is another question from Nito says, in working dynamic markets, it is quite a challenge. Have you applied a shared value model in the area you service, given that these are perhaps the most economically challenged parts of society? Okay. Um, shared value model. No, uh, I haven't. I really, you know, at certain times when we started Kulula, uh, it's not like we thought, oh, no, let me start an e-commerce business. Uh, we ran a survey in my ward, in my village, of 2,500 households to discover what were their top five biggest challenges. The other four I couldn't solve because they were capital projects, not having water, not having a safe toilet, not having electricity. But the one of getting food to their doorstep came across at least 70% of our customer base. So we started that online grocery shop by finding out what are your top 20 products that you buy on a month to month basis? So we put that um, uh, as an opportunity for them to purchase. And when would you like to have your food? When do you usually make your purchases? So we've been actually just trying to solve a problem that exists and not to try different things that, uh, yes, they've been tested, but what we are currently doing now is working. And since we are growing at least up 304% year on year, so we are growing and it's working. So we see no use of trying new model. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Sia, for, for that response. I think just to wrap up, it would be really great to hear from each one of you. Just We've obviously gone through a pandemic that was completely unexpected and it, is, it has come with its own challenges and potentially opportunities. What would you like to say to anyone either wanting to get into e-commerce or wanting to get into um, digital, um, the digital economy? Um, I think for, for me, one of the biggest things um, is to research, uh, especially if you are going into selling a product. Um, I think a lot of times uh, entrepreneurs go into business without doing proper research and understanding the industry they're going into the market, understanding the uh, targets audience as well as to who they are servicing and the needs for the people they are servicing. Um, and then if you are going to be selling a product, then you obviously need to educate yourself in terms of how to, to sell online, because that is one of the easiest ways you can reach your audience nowadays, instead of having a shop, uh, it's obviously cheaper than having to do that. Um, and a lot of platforms online have now made it so much easy to sell. Facebook has Facebook markets. You know, if you have an online shop, you can link your, your, your online shop to these platforms for free. So um, I think it's to just make sure you're doing your research correctly. You're working with the right people to build whatever system or platform you're wanting to build. Uh, and just making sure that your online strategy is obviously done correctly as well. Because if you're going to be going online, without a plan and a strategy in place, then you, you're not going to see the money or time that you will be putting in into it uh, to, in order for you to be reaching the audience that you say you want to reach. Um, and a lot of times people figure out that, okay, if it's not working, it's because the people are not there. But in all honesty, if you are doing it correctly and you are doing it right with the right plan, you will reach your audience and you will make your sales. So before jumping into something, um, especially e-commerce and products, because you're putting a lot of money uh, towards that. Just make sure that the plan is done right um, and you are doing it correctly in order for you to see the success behind it. Thanks, Notando. And yourself, Enrico or Vincent? So I guess that from, from my side, uh, um, I would, uh, my biggest suggestion is do it. Is the right time, it's e-commerce, it's in Africa, it's the right time in the right place to do it. Of course, as Nontando was saying, you gotta research it, you gotta do it right, but you gotta do it. The, the biggest, the, the, one of the, 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 the most common uh, comments that we were getting or we're still getting on our Facebook page is, uh, you stole my idea, right? Of course, how many people have thought about launching an alcohol delivery app? And uh, the only difference is that we've done it. And if I could go back in my career, I would probably start earlier. I would probably um, 
I would probably leave corporate earlier. Um, and I, I think that if you, if you, you know, attend a, a, a business school, you shouldn't attending a business school to be in corporate. Go and be an entrepreneur and make a much bigger change than go in corporate. You really don't need a business school to go in corporate. It's, it's, it's much easier than you think it is. <laughs> Sure, Aniko. So everyone is saying you stole the idea because yeah. all of us have wanted to start of course, a, right? an alcohol delivery app. <laughs> we sure. just and did yourself, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and yourself, Sianda? Well, you know, I think I've mentioned this before uh, when, once we had the chat, is that uh, you did mention earlier on that um, 60% uh, of the income in this country goes to the minority of people, which is totally correct. However, the minority of people in this country make a lot of money from the majority of people. So we consume a lot of the majority. But the question is, right, how do we tap in that consumption? How do we tap in by having access to that money? So I want us to look at how do we leverage our unfair advantage? The unfair advantage of understanding the traditional cultural mannerisms of the township and rural economy. Because you understand them, no one is a better situation than to create solutions to solve these problems because we experienced them and we grew up in them. Now, I must also take a couple of steps back and acknowledge that, for example, my competitors are all outlets that were founded pre-apartheid. I mean, sorry, pre-democracy, during apartheid. So whether you mentioned all the big artists, the retail artists, they're all founded then and they continue to thrive now. So it's very difficult to disrupt it, not because they're any more smarter than us, but because sort of the economical situation has played to our advantage. Now, in order for you to disrupt that, it will take a whole lot of money, of course, which is really difficult to attain, especially as a black African, a black South African. But the question is, how do you use that unfair advantage of understanding the cultural and traditional norms of the society that you live in to turn it into a business in order to leapfrog the traditional society? Once you find that it's an unfair advantage that you have, I believe that it will set you apart. And then as Enrico said, start, start. Find your niche and start, and you will fail, but opportunity will find you around the way. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Sia, for that powerful response. I think it is quite um, important for people to know that there is opportunity in Africa and South Africa specifically having its own unique ways of consumption that you will find that it is much more easier for people who have either lived in the country and experienced um, what it looks like to be a consumer in South Africa because it's different to other parts of the world and first world countries. So that was quite a great nugget of insight. And thank you to the Vitz Business School uh, for having us come on board. And we really, really feel like these types of sessions are important. We're at the cusp of a new economy and a really great potentially a great um, future in South Africa with the digital space. So thank you everyone for joining us. We also have a YouTube channel and you can subscribe to our platforms in that sense. Thanks, Samke. And I want to just finish off by actually agreeing with Enrico. Just get going. The first lesson of digitalization is just get something done. Get a minimum viable product out there. Get moving. Um, yes, eventually you need to apply all the business school theory, but just get going. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you again, hopefully on a future session in the near future. Cheers.